Hi everyone, Anthony Fantano here, internet's busiest music nerd, hope you're doing well, and it is time for another edition of Let's Argue, where I go online, I get your hot takes and all that stuff, yada yada yada, you know what it is, but in this episode, we took a special request. I asked you, in your opinion, what is my worst, worst album review and why, and uh, um, now, now I will be responding to those takes. Let's go. Damn, related it too much to his other works instead of as a work in full. I personally don't get this ongoing gripe with, oh, they're, they're, you compared the new album too much to the artist's previous albums when in actuality our perception of nearly all art is based on our previous experience and context. We wouldn't even be talking about Damn if not for every goddamn record Kendrick put out before it. Kendrick himself compared his creative process on this album to Section 80, uh, saying that, hey, he wasn't bogged down by the need to do some sort of linear narrative like on his past couple of LPs. He was able to uh, approach a bunch of different topics separately and bring them together into one record. So, I mean, it's it, the, the artist himself is making a comparison to previous works. And by those standards, I mean, I don't even really think Damn holds up to even Section 80, because while it's cool to put out uh, a record of individual ideas and statements and expressions, Damn, I think, has the weaker crop of songs. Obviously, a review should not entirely contain, oh, this song's not like this other song, and this song's not like this other song, and this song's not like this other song from a bunch of previous albums. There's no point to that, but the review I put out for Damn is literally 20 minutes in length. I did not spend the entirety of that review just comparing every aspect of Damn to everything Kendrick had done previously. I had plenty of isolated critiques for individual tracks uh, that I just didn't care for all that much. Unknown Memory, one of the best and most influential albums of the last decade, and you gave it a four. Well, since your argument here is mostly based on the influence of Unknown Memory, um, no. I don't see it, I don't hear it, I don't get it. There are other cloud rap and cloud rap inspired projects, mixtapes out there that are way better and way more influential than Unknown Memory. Six Kiss, God's Father, Live Love ASAP, are you fucking kidding me? So if we're just jacking off Unknown Memory based off of what we perceive to be its influence, there are way more influential records in this lane. I thought your review of Carrie and Lowell was a bit underwhelming. I think giving it a seven was unfair. The emotion and power of the album warrants at least an eight or nine. I don't think you really grasped the deep emotional impact that it had. Well, the deep and emotional impact of a record is something that is felt more on a personal and an individual basis. I have no way of gauging uh, what the emotional impact of a record is for you, nor can I base my reviews on that. But still, having said that, I do like the album, and I don't deny that there are some very serious and personal and emotional topics being approached on Carrie and Lowell, and I did enjoy uh, hearing uh, many of the songs from this record uh, live when I caught Sufian touring behind this record too. I thought they were absolutely gorgeous uh, in the live setting. But uh, I still thought that the instrumentals and the aesthetics, the recording, uh, were underwhelming enough consistently and one-dimensional enough consistently to kind of kneecap the enjoyability of the record a little bit. I think emotion on a record, I think personal feelings on a record are ultimately a good thing, but they alone do not make a record fantastic in my opinion. There have to be other things working in tandem with that. Care For Me wasn't given a fair chance. Yeah, while I didn't review it full-length style in the same way that I do other records, there wasn't a whole lot about what Saba was doing on that project that really stopped me in my tracks. While there is certainly uh, raw talent there, uh, I can't deny that, I feel like he needs a better produced, better sequenced, and groomed project for that to really shine at some point into the future, which is certainly possible. Cherry Bomb, the production is great, and it has legitimately good songs throughout but it only got a four because you weren't expecting Tyler to make that type of music. Referring back to my review, not only did I give this album a three, not a four. 
But also, there were elements of the record I was severely disappointed with, and elements of it that I thought were kind of impressive. For sure, the Neo Soul direction that he was taking some of the tracks in uh, made for some really refined uh, spots on the record, and certainly were a nice change of pace from a lot of the more hideous, distorted tracks that I think were uh, doing Tyler's talent a disservice. While I don't mind Tyler going in an aggressive direction, I think the way he tried to um, make those tracks sound aesthetically just, uh, just made them difficult to listen to. Your review of Mitski's Be the Cowboy was very closed-minded IMO. I don't want to say only women understand Mitski, but like, she speaks to us in ways men can't really comprehend. I mean, I do like Puberty 2 a bit more than uh, Be the Cowboy, but regardless, um, w whether or not I am into Mitski, uh, your comment here is, is a little out of pocket considering the, the sea of men that love her goddamn music. I think maybe you could say generally, uh, women, who uh, uh, listen to music, maybe resonate more with uh, other women singer-songwriters. I don't know. Uh, maybe that's an assumption that you could make. But uh, but still, I mean, it's not like Mitski um, is having a really hard time uh, appealing to indie bros, you know what I mean? <laughs> That's, that's the first time I've heard that narrative. But yeah, I guess on the record, I, I appreciate that uh, maybe aesthetically and at some points instrumentally, it's, it's one of her uh, uh, most ambitious projects. Uh, certainly seem to uh, see her stepping out of her comfort zone a bit, but uh, some of the songs on it just weren't really landing for me. Um, Simultaneously, this reminds me of a comment that I got on a Let's Argue a long time ago about how uh, men don't get Lana, <laughs> don't get Lana Del Rey, and then lo and behold, immediately after she puts out her best fucking record, that like everyone across the board is just like, wow, this is like this is the best damn Lana album. <laughs> so I don't know. I I think a. Uh, uh, Mitski just hasn't like really put out that one record yet that's blown me away. M83 Hurry Up We're Dreaming doesn't seem like you gave many reasons for not liking it besides that the album has too many interludes and chill parts. I don't see how that warrants a 4 out of 10. Because they take up so much goddamn space on the album, and then on top of it, the core tracks on the record, and it's so funny that I didn't even need to look up my review or anything about this record, because what pissed me off about it uh, is just like so fresh in my memory, because it's such an aggravating album. The core songs on the record don't even weave together that well, nor are they all that great either. It's not like uh, M83's best material or anything. So yeah, it just sort of seems like a fake double album. I feel like if it was a real double record, it would flow so much better, not have so much filler, and and it would feel a lot more connected and thematic, but it doesn't. It's just a fucking mess. Not a review, but your Led Zeppelin tier list is god-awful. Houses of the Holy in C tier with no quarter, the song remains the same. You didn't even mention Over the Hills and Far Away. It belongs in A or S tier. Look, bro, if you want to listen to the crunge and that goddamn reggae song too, then listen to it. I know she didn't mention them here because they're not good. And while I do like those songs that you did bring up here, it's one of their more inconsistent LPs and it's nowhere near as fucking fantastic as physical goddamn graffiti. Childish Gambino because the internet. A lot of your review was spent critiquing the incoherence of the screenplay and not actually the music on the record. A five is ridiculous for how well produced and performed each song was on BTI. Still love you though, fan to on. There are a few reasons behind me focusing on the screenplay in the review. One, it's not often you get a screenplay along with an album. So I thought it was at least worth reading, talking about, dissecting in some sort of way. He released them together. Clearly he wanted them to be appreciated together in some sense. Number two, the narrative of the record, which there very clearly is one, isn't portrayed all that coherently or cohesively on the record itself. So if you want to try to fill in the gaps and get a greater understanding of what's being communicated in the music, you have to kind of look at the screenplay. So the disjointedness of the story on the album, in a way, forces you to look elsewhere to get a greater understanding of it. Ultimately, though, my divided feelings on the record lie with the fact that a lot of the tracks I just think are kind of meh. If the album was full of bangers or songs that I loved, honestly, I wouldn't care that it's attached to a shoddy screenplay that I think is really trite. Dance Gavin Dance, instant gratification. The review itself seems a little biased, seeing how you're not much of a fan of that genre. And on top of that, instant gratification is probably the 
worst album to summarize the sound and styles of Dance Gavin Dance as a whole. Well, that was also partially my philosophy going into the the review, that for Dance Gavin Dance, a band who previously I, I didn't really care for, this seemed like sh like especially bad, shockingly bad, like how needlessly busy and noodly and annoying so much of the drums and guitar work were, uh, compounded with how awful some of the vocals were and some of the weird transitions into, you know, stuff like rap verses just seemed like totally unnecessary and goofy. And while sure, the, the strain of post-hardcore that Dance Gavin Dance's music represents uh, much of the time I'm not a huge fan of, but uh, you know, it wouldn't be the first time I was wowed by a record or a record blew me away in a style of music or in, within a trend that I don't usually care for. So, you know, I'm trying to, you know, listen to some stuff here and there, even though I, I, I know that I may not enjoy it. I might be surprised. I feel like you kind of overlooked the lyrical and compositional concept on Magdalene. The album stripped back presentation was one of more avant-garde presentation to depict her trying to pick herself back up after a journey through sorrow. She didn't want to make another LP1, nor did I really want her to make another LP1. Honestly, uh, sure. Fair. Uh, I was not all that deep into the lyrical themes or uh, overarching storyline of the record, if there was in fact one, not denying that or anything. But um, honestly, at the end of the day, aesthetically and instrumentally, what ended up disappointing me about the LP wasn't that it was just too minimal or something, but that a lot of the album was derivative or just not as adventurous as LP1. Uh, while I didn't want her to just make another record with Arca or another Arca sounding record or uh, just another album that sounded anything like LP1, I wasn't expecting that given the lead tracks, given the teaser tracks to the record. I don't think one could go into this record expecting another LP1 after having heard that goddamn Future song. Still, that doesn't really change my opinion that tracks such as that one are mediocre and that a whole host of other ones were really derivative of stuff like Kate Bush, which is odd considering that prior Twigs had a pretty definitive sound, uh, why she would want to trade that in for something that was like so obviously pulling from somewhere else and not really doing an interesting spin on it in the process, I don't know. But hey, look, at the end of the day, I still like the record, just not head over heels for it in the same way other people have been. Your review of King Cruel's The Ooze. I think the less direct nature of that project made for Archie's most potent and satisfying material yet. It is a raw tapestry that has an enigmatic beauty to it that I find so captivating, but all of these elements seem to hit you the wrong way. Um, yes, absolutely. I like that this tweet essentially <laughs> acknowledges that I guess what exactly I hated about the record uh, you liked. I just find how drawn out a lot of these tracks are to be uh, very tedious, unnecessary, and on top of it, uh, there are some tracks that, frankly, are not even th that long, but so severely lack structure, uh, I just don't really get a whole lot out of them. However, uh, you know, maybe you guys are just more into the vibe, and that's fine. You know, a, a lot of shit out there right now that's popular is, is certainly a vibe, and uh, it, just, it just is what it is, I guess. And that is going to be the last one in this episode of Let's Argue. Thank you very much for watching. Over here next to my head is another video that you can check out. Hit that up or the link to subscribe to the channel. Anthony Fantano reviews my worst ones forever.